Okay, good. Also, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, the sound, let's regulate. Um, I'm very excited to see such a full lecture hall um, and I have to move out of the light here. Uh, it gets me very energized uh, to see so many people now on a Monday evening. Um, yeah, welcome to the third session of Juxtaposition. My name is Lukas Feireis and um, for those of you that don't know me, um, I'm a visiting professor at the school since three semesters and I'm pushing transdisciplinary uh, projects within the field of artistic education in the wider sense. And one of the core elements is this lecture series. Who of you have been here in the last two semesters or last semester? Raise your hands proudly. So it's a, um, like a third-ish. Um, so the, um, the focus or the idea behind this lecture series is to introduce you. Come. Hello. To a, a great variety of cultural producers who work outside the box, who don't really fit into uh, categories. Um, the, the light is so blinding, that's why. Um, who, who don't really fit into categories, and I always say who draw outside the line. And um, this is in order for you to kind of get more of an idea um, what really it means to be involved in the artistic practice, that it's very rarely that you stick in one discipline or in one practice and that the realities of working life eventually means that you will be collaborating with very different people and that you will probably engage also in very different things that you maybe have learned during your studies or you maybe are becoming an architect but you will end up a stage designer or maybe a theatre writer. So it doesn't really matter so much um, what you really studied is my, my opinion. Um, so this is very much about transdisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity. I thought this meme was very really funny from a friend of mine, Jim. Um, if you don't know Freeze Magazine, it's kind of the funniest Instagram account for art memes. So if you're in the art world, and you know, it's, it's like he makes me laugh once a day, which is really a, a special thing. Um, so this is, in, in a way, what I'm trying to understand myself and what I'm also trying to understand with you guys and also with the people that I invite to this uh, lecture series. And um, uh, we had like, th this is the third edition. I'll quickly run you also to understand, for you to understand what's happening tonight. It's basically going to be an introduction. So I'm going to run you through the last couple of um, um, semesters. I'm going to give you an introduction of actually um, who I am, kind of what I do, so you can kind of tr um, understand a little bit better where I'm coming from, and then you know we, we have time to discuss. And I would also like to find out from what different fields of studies you guys uh, come from. So uh, we started off exactly one year ago in October uh, 2021 uh, with a very um, diverse group of speakers, um, ranging from architect Juana Stonescu to Omsk Social Club, um, a collective that does, um, yeah, in a way, interactive performances that lead the digital space and the real world. Um, Matilda uh, Krzyzewski, a curator. Um, Sarah um, Franklin, artist. Uh, Lottig, um, a musician. Tabita Rezea, uh, an artist from French Guyana. Isaac Kuriaki from um, Kenya slash London. Hans-Ulrich Obrist, uh, Candice Williams, Nicholas Boyou, Susan Kennedy, Yi Wan Song, Katja Nowitzkova. So really, really big ass names in the cultural world and total newcomers. And this is kind of the idea of kind of creating quite a flat hierarchy. I think Isaac is like 24 and quite in the beginning of his. And then again, Hans-Ulrich is super stardom in the cultural world. But this is kind of, they, they're all involved in cultural production, whether they're in the beginning of their career or uh, towards the end of or in the mid of their career, and it's very much about mm, sharing experiences. So different formats, sometimes they really present, they give you a 30-minute lecture and you hear about their work, or it's more of a conversation that I or we engage with. Um, but it's, it's always a moment where we get actually quite intimate to all of these people. They're all archived and they can be found on the website, so if you have missed some of these lectures and you're interested to see them, then you can still watch them. It's been a very uh, inspirational ride for me too. And then in the second semester, uh, so in the summer, I focused a little bit more on um, Berlin-based artists and also of a younger generation, from Chami, who's a um, uh, UDK um, 
graduate in fashion and design originally and, uh, and then becoming artist. Ariel Ephraim Ashbel, who is a theater maker, a performance maker from Tel Aviv, who is based in Berlin since many years. Uh, Daniel Brethwaite Shirley um, is an artist who engages in creating yeah, digital archives using uh, the medium of computer games. It's usually um, uh, trans archives or um, black trans archives. Ute Meta Bauer uh, is a curator, a very well known international curator, and kind of my mentor in many ways. So, my first assistance I did to her when I, uh, when I graduated. Um, and the continuous, continu continuous um, of, of different speakers that we had from the world of performance, film, and then Tom Sachs as the, the last artist, which was a real fun lecture. And this semester, this kind of broad uh, variety um, continues, um, which you probably already have seen on, uh, on the website. We are a little bit like offbeat. It's sometimes weekly, sometimes it's not weekly, so you really have to look into the calendar to understand when the next lecture is. And I'll also say it. Um, we will start next week, week with Li Ning, who is a Berlin based, actually from Berlin, an artist who is a videographer and a musician and a dancer and choreographer and singer who um, is going to be, present, uh, be present and present his work uh, next week. Then we have Laurentino Holzinger, a performance maker from Austria, who uh, recently um, had the opening of a piece at the Volksbühne. Maybe you're familiar with the work. It's you know cars doing donuts and motorcycles and naked people, and it's like a, quite a wild uh, extravaganza. Um, and then in we have um, Sehat Isek and Benjamin Husby from GmbH GmbH, um, a Berlin-based fashion design duo, also the creative director of, of Trusadi, Defna Ayas, um, curator, um, Turkish curator based in Berlin, who serves as curator and director and advisor to many uh, cultural institutions around the world. She was also the curator of the Guangzhou Biennial, the last one, but also curated uh, or co-curated the Moscow Biennale and many others, so um, very established in her practice, GV. Lee is a Korean artist based in Berlin who also graduated from the UDK, more in the field of um, sculpture and painting and also performance. Uh, Samir Banta, we actually invited in the first semester already, hello, um, but uh, he couldn't make it because he uh, had to intend um, the uh, funeral of Virgil Abloh and that's also the connection point. Uh, Samir is an architect and a curator. And he um, is the director of AMO. So AMO is the think tank of OMA. So the architects amongst you know OMA, that's the architectural firm of Rem Kolas. And Samir um, runs more the think tank of it, but he collaborated very intensely with Virgil Abloh over many years, did also the Figures of Speech exhibition in the Chicago Museum and many of the uh, early off-white stores. And um, then last but not least, we have a collective from South Africa, Made You Look, that's Nara Mogotu and Molemo Moilea, who will also kind of present their work, a lot of kind of post-colonial research and studies. So this is kind of what is expecting us uh, this semester. And the way, um, uh, yeah, here a few images. We set it up, I'll explain a bit. This is uh, Li Ning. Um, this is the, uh, actually the tour was now just moved. It was supposed to start now and the album was supposed to come out now. Uh, this is a move, but this is um, some visual impressions. Yeah, this is uh, Florentina Holzinger uh, and her performances um, currently at the Volksbühne. Maybe you saw, I think it was last year at the Schinkel Pavilion, where she did these crazy donuts, you know, when cars go really fast in a circle and uh, there's like crowd being, uh, is, um, cloud smoke being created from the tires of the cars. So yes, that's Florentine Holzinger. Um, GmbH, GmbH, Serhat and Benjamin, who one is actually a fashion photographer, the other really does come from fashion, who created this very iconic um, label here in Berlin and have, you know, raised to the top of the fashion world now. Um, Defne, this was the last, um, the Guangzhou Biennial, which was also an interesting topic because they um, kind of tried to create dialectical spaces, they said, be between common or a community, uh, communal and artificial intelligence uh, that is informed or shaped by feminist, queer and, and indigenous knowledges. Um, 
She is kind of a founding curator of the Performer um, series of events in New York and, and, and many, many more. GV, with one of her recent exhibitions, um, GV Lee, uh, she had at Sexauer Gallery here in Berlin. So you see the mixture again is from very accomplished to young, always one or two or three that actually come from the school, so you get an idea of you know, where this uh, can, can lead you to. Uh, Samir, um, this was the countryside exhibition in New York, and um, he did it with OMA, and this is an uh, image from the Virgil Abloh Figures of Speech exhibition that he designed with Virgil Abloh in, um, in Chicago. And then last but not least, um, it's Made You Look, the artist duo um, from South Africa. And the beauty of it is that I'm extremely excited about it. So, um, and the beauty of being um, a professor or the beauty of being a curator is that you, your job is basically to, to invite cool people, like people that you are inspired by and that I can now share with you. And that's, um, that's a blessing, I have to say. And I'm very excited about also what's coming up the way um, this course, um, if you may call it so, is structured um, that we have um, our weekly or bi-weekly uh, speakers. Then we have you as the participating students. And, um, and well, kind of you have to jump the feedback for the first time. So there's a lecture. For example, today is my lecture. Um, usually we would have a Q&A afterwards. And then you are homework, if you want, if you just hang out here to watch the, the lectures, totally fine. No? Bring all your friends, this is open to everyone. You can bring family and friends, this is not university only. But if you want to get credits for this, if you need actually ECTS uh, points, then you have to write weekly reflections. And that's really super simple. It's just basically what inspired you, what got stuck with you, like what moved you the most of last week's lecture. That's it. And you can write a little paragraph, I mean, not just a sentence, that's not really enough, but a little paragraph. It doesn't have to be over-intellectual, you don't have to prove that you're super th theory, theory uh, kind of proof, but, um, but just your own you know, thoughts on it. If you say, I'd like to make a video, you're welcome. If you like to make a painting, fine. If you like to do an illustration, fine. It's the, the, the choice of media is completely up to you. But I want you to digest the, the lecture and think about it. And it's really an, an exercise um, for yourself, actually for all of us to, there's so much input that we get on the daily, it comes in and then there's the next input, but this really means you have to sit down for a moment and think, okay, what was this about? What really got stuck with me? What, what remained from, from the talk? And, uh, and this we will then eventually, here comes the feedback, I will start each session with a little overview of your feedback. Yeah? So I kind of I'll read your feedback in a way back in small snippets to the class so we get a kind of an impression in, of how everybody is thinking. Because it's a big group, as you can see, it's like it's almost a party now in here. And um, our challenge is to create, make this as intimate as possible this, despite the, the big group. Hence, we will also have um, group work. Yeah, weekly reflection, and then this is new. This was actually um, on um, uh, invitation of or uh, inspira inspired by um, comments from students from last semester that they said it would be nice to have something where actually this beautiful group of people here come together and do something together. Hence, we have actually, I'm not sure, two or three sessions where we work as a group. I haven't fully yet figured out what we will do. <laughs> we, will, we will see. But we'll do something together. And I think this is really also for creating connections because there's a lot of interesting people in this room, not me, but you guys. And some of you, maybe you know the one that's sitting next to you, left and right, but maybe the others you don't. And it's a nice way to connect. Um, yeah, so that's, that's roughly the, um, the setup. Um, before I come to this, um, or maybe in combination with this, um, some of you I already saw this morning from 10 to 1, because I'm doing also um, um, another educational format that's a colloquium. That's a colloquium for graduate students, and also so more in your master level or towards the end of your studies, where you can discuss, again, not in such a big group, but in a group of um, students from very different backgrounds, you can discuss 
uh, and talk about your ideas for your master thesis. And uh, we had our first ride today, which was, I think, very beautiful and inspiring. If anyone wants to still join, hit me up. Um, you're always welcome. But uh, it's a very special project for me too, um, because it's really about learning how to communicate with one another about your own projects and also um, creating a culture of constructive critique that you can really think yourself into other projects and try to help them make them better. That's kind of the main intention. It's basically my intention as an educator as well. I'm here to help, number one, and or offer my help, let's put it this way, uh, or whatever you want to call it, and, um, and try to see how I can be of assistance to make your stuff even sharper than it is. And that's also post-protocol. And now I'm actually I'm curious, in the big group, um, the different kind of disciplines in the room. So let's say fine arts, could you raise your hand? That's a big turn around. That's, that's actually a lot, a lot. beautiful. Um, um, architecture. That's a lot too. How about product design? It's actually <laughs> most product designers on excursion. <laughs> most of the product designers are uh, somewhere uh, out of town, I noticed. And um, how about fashion? Well, nice. How about acting? In the back row? No, yes. <laughs> Representing in the back row. Very nice. How about music in the widest uh, sense? <laughs> it's both. Musical and theater. Okay. Um, did I say costume already? Co costume build? No, oh, I see a few there. Um, Gesellschaft und Wirtschaftskommunikation. Yes, they're everywhere. Um, okay, who did I miss? Yes, what, what do we study? Design and computation. Design and computation, sorry, I'm so sorry for forgetting design and computation, very important. Uh, and you? And dance. And dance. Beautiful. Who do you study with there? A lot of people. Yeah. Like it's in the health of day. Yeah. And this year started with uh, Lynn Kaufner and Jason and uh, a lot of dancers. Maya Colucci. Cool. It's a very good, good group over there. I love the space. And I missed you too. Ah, yeah. Visual communication. Who's visual communication? Yes. Nice. Okay. Um, and anyone else I forgot? Yes, you. Art and media, what about Kunst im Kontext? Ooh, no Kunst im Kontext today. <laughs> well, it's <laughs> uh, excursion, <laughs> exactly. Um, but it's interesting because it's slightly changing each semester. It's, it's, uh, I like that. But you can see already you can learn a lot from another, one another. There's a lot of different backgrounds in this, in this room. So, um, that said, um, I um, thought that I'll give you a quick introduction into my own practice. I did something similar about a year ago um, when I did my opening lecture for this. Very few, if any of you, were there, but however, I now focused on projects uh, I worked on since uh, in the last six months. So basically, since the summer semester of last year. Um, I run a curatorial practice, um, um, which is more or less a one-man show, and I uh, kind of work then, however, in very um, small and big teams. And it's um, cultural translation in the widest sense of the world. So I um, uh, try to um, translate um, topics that seem relevant to me to a broad audience, from kids to students to professionals to um, senior citizens, so really try to um, not focus on one specific target group, but try to get it as broad as possible and work highly uh, disciplinary. Thereby, I do teaching. I do a lot of exhibitions as a curator. I sometimes uh, also do exhibitions as an artist. Uh, a lot of books. Books is a medium that I'm quite addicted to. Um, and um, symposiums, so all sorts of means of communication is what I'm interested in. Yet, I am not a designer of such, but more the, the content. So this is just a screenshot of from today from, from my website. And a few words about my um, background or also my inspirations, because usually you learn more about someone's inspiration than actually about the work. And um, 
And actually, if so, juxtaposition co will continue also next semester. Um, but after that, I would like to give it an end with juxtapositions, but I would like, if everything works out, with a new lecture series called Inspired By. And I would like to invite the same kind of people, like fire, amazing people, but they're not allowed to talk about their work, but only about the inspirations. I think that would be really, really fascinating. So, quick run up to my inspirations. So, I um, heavily grew up on Mad Magazine. It's a format that doesn't really exist anymore, but I inherited from my bigger brother. It was actually a thing really in like early 80s, but um, I had like stacks that I uh, got from my bigger brother and it totally formed my sense of humor. It's kind of a weekly or monthly journal that kind of reflected on contemporary issues or pop cultural issues or did a remake of the latest movie, but with a very weird very weird, sarcastic twist to it. And, um, but I liked also the form of publishing. It was this like Ips magazine would be something also in that uh, genre. And then I eventually, uh, I grew up in Berlin. I am from Berlin, born and raised. Um, and uh, then I studied at the FU and in uh, Rome at La Sapienza. Uh, I studied philosophy and I studied comparative religious studies and ethnology slash anthropology. And um, there I, um, even though, side note, I actually always wanted to apply to the UDK to study um, visual communication, actually, this is you know, a long time ago. But then I somehow thought, now I'll do something different, and then uh, that's where I ended up, but now I'm back here. Um, so I studied um, these, the uh, fields and had, however, quite a focus on space uh, or space, spatial issues or space-related issues. So in philosophy, I focused on the metaphor of space or uh, the metaphor of architecture in philosophical discourses. So how um, the, all the great philosophers from Plato to, I don't know, Nietzsche to, you name it, they all go back to architectural metaphors as, as if they can't handle it without it. And it seems to me that there's usually very abstract um, knowledge systems and they need somehow a very concrete metaphor and it tends to be the house or architecture or space. Um, and this is something explored there in religious studies are focused very much on the language of uh, ecclesiastical buildings, meaning churches, synagogues, mosques, temples, like how do these uh, kind of religious buildings communicate also their ideas through the building form and in Ethnology are focused on urban anthropology, so the, the urban habitat is uh, the new place of, of living for the majority of people on this planet. In this context, uh, Paul Valéry, a French poet, was very influential to me. There's a book on Palinos or The Architect, where like two dead Greek philosophers uh, passed away and they think they, they meet and they look at the, you know, their past lives and they talk about an architect, Ol Palinos who they knew, who was able to create buildings that speak, that sing, or that could also be silent. And that really very postmodern idea you know, of like speaking architecture, but I, I was really intrigued um, by that. Kind of really influenced in my studies. And again, this list could be, I could do like 30 pages just inspirations, but this is just a few snippets. Um, Walter Benjamin, um, that you probably have heard during your studies, um, uh, German philosopher, cultural thinker, essayist, um, who um, eventually um, committed suicide fleeing the, the Nazi regime, but he, he was known for his very sharp reflections on the world we live in, um, the, the urban culture we live in, but always in kind of a very fragmentary approach. So he didn't believe in the whole story, but that we only can tell fragments. And one of his like, most famous post-mortem works is called Passagenwerk, where he, which was put together out of little snippets they found, like cut out newspaper articles, uh, short thoughts, longer articles, and all next to each other. And I very much believe in this type of thinking um, that is kind of non-hierarchical and non-linear and more actually fragmentary than, than anything else. The Public Enemy album was the first album that I ever bought for my own money. So this is really, I was heavily, heavily influenced by hip hop culture from the very beginning. And this is, you know, with own, own pocket money to World of Music uh, and then bought this, this album and I like listened to it days, back and forth, back and forth um, to the annoyance of my parents. But it really brought something completely new, like a mindset 
to me of how what you can do with sounds, how you can work with samples, how you can create something completely new of something already existing, how you can quote a lot of things uh, in that that it's not just sound but it's actually political reference to it. So there was um, a very like uh, like a real game changer, I have to say, for myself. And then um, Marshall McLuhan, um, famous media theorist that you probably also have come across. Um, who, who was a literary scholar. He was actually a scholar of medieval English literature, but he um, is also the patron saint of media theory. He basically created media theory. So thinking about media as such that media, whether it's a TV or computer or radio or a printing press, that they have an effect on us. And um, he uh, coined the saying, um, the medium is the message. You probably heard that, no? Um, meaning that the mediums that we're using is actually the real message, more important than what is shown. Um, so I think there's a saying something, it doesn't matter whether the machine, the medium produces cornflakes or Cadillacs, the fact that there is the medium, the machine, that's the important thing. So if I have a screen and it shows, I don't know, uh, uh, the Smurfs or whether it shows the porn, it doesn't really matter as much as that there is a TV there, yeah? So this is kind of the thinking. And, and what I liked about him, that he was a super intellectual, yet he was able, to, together with um, Jerome Angel and uh, Quentin Fiori, to create a little pocketbook, which in a way popularized his ideas, but brought it in a, gave it a pop cultural language. So real theory, but then cut it down to small sentences or um, only just a sentence and the black and white images, and it's, it's the, the Penguin books, uh, Medium is the Message, it's a Bible. Every book that I do is, is my reference point to go to. Um, Jack Halberstam is a, a queer theorist um, who um, here has been um, in her theoretical approach uh, very influential to me, and I only came across her theories uh, at a later stage, actually after my studies, and she, uh, within the queer studies, um, developed this concept of um, the scavenger methodology. So a scavenger, do you know what a scavenger is? It's a weird term. So a scavenger is someone who kind of collects stuff that's left over. Or a scavenger could also be an animal that feeds on dead animals. Yeah, but someone who collects. And the scavenger methodology is one, again, totally unhierarchic, that in an academic context you use inputs materials from completely diverse sources of information. So you can use a lecture here, you, you can use your um, Instagram uh, whatever uh, account and look for something, YouTubes or academic papers, but really mix them totally together and create them on the same level. Yeah? So no differentiation between low and high culture in your academic research. And that was for me so liberating to understand, okay, yes, because that's what I've been doing for the whole time. Because, yes, we all are influenced by you know, all the stuff that we are very buff, and then that feels that there's this alternative world, which is the academic world, but no, you can actually bring them together. And just as a reference to movies, I'm um, deep into movies, but this has been also when I saw this movie first um, in the cinema, and it came out, it was very impactful. Um, for me, if you haven't seen that movie, you must see the movie, um, what you can watch. And Donna Haraway, which is a year with the octopus, um, probably also a name, it's become very popular in the last couple of years, um, but uh, a scholar that um, has taught me in a way to stay with the trouble. It's the title of a very famous book of Donna Haraway, meaning you go where the trouble is. Like in whatever you do, whether you're a fine artist or an architect or a theater or a visual communication, like stay with the trouble. You know, that's so it hurts, like put your finger on it and show up. That's a big lesson. So she said, like, show up. You have to you know, show up to this lecture, be here on Monday at 6 o'clock, or if there's demonstrations that are important to you, go there, show up, like, go to the opening. It's, it's always about showing, showing up. That's how things get done. And there's another thing that she has this idea that we're all multiples, that in order to be one, you have to be many. Yeah. Again, this fragmentary thought um, that also connects to uh, Halberstam and Benjamin. And uh, last but not least, Edouard Lisson, a um, uh, uh, French uh, Caribbean philosopher, essayist, uh, writer, poet um, from Martinique, who um, uh, is known for a book called The Poetics of Relations. So he really looks into how relations are built, and he does that against the backdrop of the 
Caribbean world or the archipelago of the Caribbean where um, identities are constructed from cultures that have been forced to leave kind of from the African continent to the uh, Americas and have then settled in this archipelago of, of, of islands and creating identities that consist again of many. Same, in order to be one you have to be many and he uh, on a thought uh, level um, spoke of continental knowledge and the knowledge of the archipelago. So the continental knowledge, the image of one continent, oof, massive, big, mm, closed. Um, uh, and the, the, uh, the knowledge, the archipelagical thinking, is that it kind of thinks in jumps, thinks in fragments. And that's again something that I feel very related to, and which then again connects to Mad Magazine, but also to Public Enemy, you know, like working with like sample and snippets and ideas. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, so what do I do? Um, I do um, a lot of books, and this is a few of them. I think I've edited and published or authored um, over 30 books now in the last um, yeah, 15 something years. A lot of them started um, in, in the field of architecture, so space is, as I said, like a recurring theme in my work, uh, but they range from coffee table books to theory books um, to, you know, everything there is. I'll show you in more detail, detail a few. One project, for example, which is already very, very old, and we printed maybe 100 copies and on a risograph machine with a friend, and of these 100 copies, we actually lost half of them somewhere. They got lost in transition, but, uh, um, you know, uh, so keep, <laughs> you know, take care of your work. Um, and this was called Ladi Dadi, the Eclectic Manifesto. This was the time where I was very much researching upon artistic manifestos, which um, were very um, prominent uh, up into the early 20s, mid 20th century. There's some, but it, they're kind of out of vogue. It's like there's not so many manifestos written anymore, but I was really into it. And then I realized, well, I can't write one that's silly, but to me, music is uh, something, or pop culture, uh, is almost like a manifesto or for my whole generation that I have like song titles that are really meaningful to me. They're not just a song title but a, or a line in a song, maybe you know that too, that really they have, uh, they have an emotional meaning. So, um, and so I made this encyclopedia slash um, uh, yeah, manifesto out of song t titles from, from A to Z. Um, and kind of illustrated them and gave them like a fake dictionary definition. But this is just a playful work. Then another one that is very dear to me and kind of also shows you a bit how I work uh, is this one, Memories of the Moon Age or Der Traum von der Reise zum Mond, um, where I um, engaged in a yeah, uh, exploration of mankind's dream of flying to the moon. So not just the moon, but since when do we as human, humanity kind of dream about going to the moon. And uh, did this chronologically, like from the you know, beginning, um, from antiquity until today, and low and high culture and everything across. And basically one story more or less per page. So you could flip that book up on page 166 or on 51 and it's a one page story, or you can actually chronologically read through it. Read through it. But um, what um, I, no, uh, what I um, really like about this topic um, is that um, it's a very powerful message or a metaphor again for, um, for the arts or the power of imagination, the power of fiction and the power of creative production because it all started with the fiction. No? We, before we went to the moon, we first dreamt about going to the moon and we were, there was fiction written about it and there was always this interconnection usually there was a technological innovation, I don't know, the Galileo revolutionized the telescope so you could actually see the moon and so wow, this looks like a mountain on Earth and you kind of saw it similar to us and then suddenly there was a, I don't know, 60 books written about moon travel. But this was inspired by a technological innovation in the beginning. And then, I don't know, the hot air balloon was uh, invented and then they thought, oh wow, we could go with hot air. So, and on, 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 until we hit, for example, Jules Verne and then Jules Verne basically shot a bullet, more or less, to the, uh, in the story to the moon, but um, this triggered all the rocket scientists that eventually built the, the rocket that took us to the moon. And in every interview you read, they say, yeah, I was 10 years old and I read Jules Verne and I wanted to make this 
you know, real. So you can see how a pure piece of fiction or a pure piece of art can be totally world changing yeah? or world discovering. And hence, it's important what we do. <laughs> it's really important what you do. If you feel kind of sometimes, oh, this is not important. No, it can be this shit might inspire someone to fucking go to the moon. Um, and the last book I did um, was Space is the Place, which was based on a whole um, a series of exhibitions I curated in Munich at the BNKR. There were reflections on the interrelationship of art and architecture. A lot of um, artists that um, work in space or with space. The first um, part was kind of focusing on more like thresholds, how you enter a space, the limits and limitations of spaces. Um, then we um, went into, uh, like all the way to outer space. But a lot of different artists reflecting upon this. There was a symposium, there was a lecture series, and this was all then combined in this book. Um, from Andrea Fraser to Olaf Eliasson, or uh, Bruce Naumann, Wermke Leinkauf. So again, high, low, uh, everything uh, mixed, um, but all um, intervening in space, or uh, again, there's the title comes actually from Sun Ra, uh, um, Afrofuturist uh, jazz musician, um, and it really means, or to me, it meant so. Space is kind of the abstract space. So, before we all entered this room, it was just a space. When we leave it tonight, it's a place because we have a narrative connected to it. You remember sitting next to your friend, or. Uh, I remember maybe a bit of the lecture, but there's something that you, you left your personal narrative in the space and it becomes a place, yeah? It doesn't, it's not abstract anymore. Yeah, so this is the book stuff. Are you cool still? Good, good. Um, and then it's exhibitions. And uh, exhibitions is um, another medium for me. Actually, I started doing books. And after a couple of books, I was approached by galleries or in gallery spaces if I would like to do an exhibition on a similar topic. And they, again, range from very large institutional shows to super small. Um, yeah, here's the spaces to place again. Uh, you see that also the communication of my project is very dear to me, so how, how do you bring it across? Mm, I'll mm, give a snippet of, let's say, the, the last three projects that I did, and also the different scales. Um, this was a show that I co-curated with the um, design practice from Berlin, the Green Isle, also UDK uh, graduates, and Tatjana Schneider, who is a professor for architecture theory in Braunschweig, for the Federal, Federal Ministry of Building. It's called Living the City, an exhibition about cities, people, and st uh, stories. And it was in the former airport Tempelhof. Did any one of you by any chance see this exhibition? One, yes, extra <laughs> points. <laughs> you passed the course. Um, so it was a very big space, like 2,000 square meters. The exhibition went up to uh, 12 meters in height, a huge, we called it narrative collage, 50 projects from Europe and beyond um, about integrative city planning, but it was really artists, architects, NGOs, uh, politicians, etc. All the different stakeholders of the places that we live in and how kind of we live and we make the city with a very, very um, strong social program of symposiums and weekly lectures and workshops, and et cetera, et cetera, and artists and residencies. But I'm saying very big scale, um, big budget, big scale, big space, big client, Federal Ministry of Building, to this project, which I did uh, last April um, in Venice, um, with a mini, 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 mini budget and more or less uh, self-run uh, out of pure fascination. Um, it was called Il Gazzettino, and um, it, um, I took over a kiosk uh, during the uh, um, preview days of the Venice Art uh, Biennale and uh, changed the content or mixed the content of it. So there I was interested in the kiosk as a, it's a really interesting urban typology, which is kind of disappearing. We had actually this discussion in, where's Olga? Yeah, yeah. We had this discussion uh, early in our colloquium um, that it used to be extremely relevant within the um, social, social structure of the city. This is the place where you got the information, you know, about your city, about the world, about everything, and has, you know, uh, lost relevance. But there's still a few left in here, but also in Italy or France as well. And this one is in Via Garibaldi. For those of you that know Venice, it's really in between the two main spots, Arsenal and Giardini. And I've been walking by there for the last 10 years and always thought, how dope would it be 
if I could take over the kiosk for a day and just change the content and make it cool. And so I approached the guy uh, there, I don't know, um, when I was in Venice, and then we made a deal, and, um, and then we, I took it over for one day. It was a lot of effort. I got a lot of like indie magazines from all over the world. All, brought them all in exactly the same boxes that you have here, Jakob. It's like literally these boxes um, from the Bauhaus um, that I filled with magazines. I drove with a car to Venice and we, we took over for six hours only this, this kiosk um, and had performances there. We had uh, every half an hour um, a, um, a magazine launch, all indie magazines. And I worked um, with friends in architecture practice from Milan called Parasite 2.0 to create these kind of temporary architectures that kind of define the space. So again, from very big to really, really small. And the last show that i show you a bit more, um, did anyone see this show? Yes. Um, that was um, an exhibition that I worked actually on for over a year and that I was on my mind for many, many, many more years um, called Transgressive Non-Conformist Approaches to Arts in the City. Uh, at the Kühlhaus, um, an exhibition that um, uh, played with my interest in uh, yeah, unauthorized, um, unasked for, um, or even illegal intervention, artistic interventions uh, in uh, the urban environment, or also into kind of um, artistic production, production per se. Um, all Berlin-based artists, 48 positions uh, in this exhibition, that um, out of which I think more than half were actually Berliners, Berliners, like born and raised, which is like, it was kind of a meeting of unicorns almost now there. And um, how many of you are natural born Berliners? Yes, representing. <laughs> and um, so, but you know, from that, it's there, and there's, there's, uh, there's a few left, and it was quite nice in the art week context to have a show with a lot of Berliners and Berlin based artists. And, um, very different from anthropology to architecture to fine arts to performance to filmmaking, etc., etc. But the, again, the common denominator is that they were transgressive in their approach. Transgressive meaning crossing boundaries, whether it's of public and private or legal and illegal or disciplinary boundaries, but this is kind of what connected. The exhibition design was again by Parasite 2.0, with whom I worked already in Venice, a very kind of minimalist approach. And in there were um, positions from the Urban ethnogra Ethnography Lab from the Humboldt University. These are visual anthropologists who really work on the city and they kind of apply artistic uh, strategies and tactics in their, in their research. Um, to Larissa Fassler, a Canadian-based artist, installation on in Palast de la République, or Stadtschloss. This was actually a memorial piece by um, by Zicke, Rust79 was a Berlin kind of train writer who committed suicide eventually. And this was one of his first piece, which was there as a Ars Memoria or like um, Objet Trouvé in the exhibition. We had a whole corner dedicated to um, uh, Adrian Nabi, who was a Berlin based curator who did a magazine called Backjump since the early 90s, which was on the early graffiti designs and did very important exhibitions in this field and brought attention or brought a lot of people that come from a graffiti background for the first time in contact with an exhibition space and in a way indirectly or directly pushed them to um, follow up on an artistic career. So a lot of people actually started studying arts afterwards. He also brought people like Banksy to Berlin when he was only known amongst people in the scene. So very early on, so it was an homage for me to him, Akim, uh, Vincent Grunwald, um, Britta Schepanski, Clemens Speer, Boris, uh, D94, um, Gabi Schillig, a professor here from the Raumklasse at the UDK in visual communication, and so on and so on. So very mixed uh, bag of, um, of, of cultural producers that were all there. And G.V. Lee, um, um, Pigeonius Cave here, Raoul Walsh, Marie Grunwald, etc. Also, uh, actually, a graduate project from UDK students. And, um, and with this, was, um, and that's what I actually always try to do, is create a very um, strong social program. So I, I think exhibitions are a great venue, but only if you use them to discuss. I, I hate white cubes, where so you just go and look at the artwork, but I'm into the discourse of things. So we had... Um, just kind of social space in the middle. There was a lot of people for the exhibition. We had a memorial event for 
dead graffiti writers from Berlin. We had a symposium on transgressive approaches in art and academia. We had a book fair and all kinds of events, uh, daily curatorial tours, but to kind of make an exhibition lively, to kind of bring the topic uh, closer to the people and dance performances and so forth and so on. Yeah. And um, this actually one sentence only is another topic I'm really interested in and I just did a symposium I curated and moderated on art and medicine. Totally different thing but a very fascinating um, topic for me at the moment that, that I'm just beginning to, to work with. Um, this was a symposium with um, medical um, researchers and doctors and professors from the Charité and Havelhöhe and the Technical University in Munich and uh, Robert Bosch, Krankenhaus in Stuttgart and uh, performers and artists to all discuss about the healing effects of arts. Um, background story, um, a couple of years ago the WHO, the World Health Organization, they did a case study, 650 case studies, um, on the uh, effect of uh, artistic or creative production or experience of. So the active creation of you know, writing a poem, um, writing in your diary, painting, sculpting, dancing, singing in the choir alone, or even the passive one. So I go to an exhibition, I go to a concert, I, you know, I go and see a lecture like this one, and what effect it has on the well-being slash health of people. And the result is amazing in these case studies, and it simply says art heals. Uh, and obviously if you break your leg, it's not like you read a Dostoevsky and you're all good, but anything that's kind of chronic uh, in your life, um, whether it's psychological or physical, um, will, um, will get better through kind of the engagement with, uh, with art. And um, there's even studies, it's crazy, like if, if you visit so and so many exhibitions, the percentage of how you will love the longer throughout your life. But like input, I think that's some, something we all learned during the lockdowns, at one point, I was at least like thirsting for a cultural input. Like the first exhibition in that I saw after the lockdown, I was, I was like almost, uh, I was so nervous because I, I, uh, I really missed it. And so that's important. So that's a big subject. Maybe it ends up in a seminar here at one point as well. But um, yeah. Um, that said, uh, quick, uh, I, I also get invited as an artist to different biennales. This was the Lyon Biennale, for example, in 2017, uh, which dealt, um, I think the topic of the Biennale was something like walking through someone's dream or something like that. And I took the opportunity um, to um, do actually a research or made a publication on, it was an architecture and urbanism Biennale. Um, I created the Sleepwalker Archive, digging in the crates of dreams, and did a more like a cultural studies analysis of the um, interrelation between dreams and architecture, or actually architecture in dreams. So, like the early descriptions of um, psychoanalogy um, and the conversation between Freud and Jung actually also always go back to this architectural metaphor, which I uh, mentioned before in the philosophical discourse. Or this project that I did for the Architecture Biennale again in 2018, and Tattoos for Architects, where we developed um, a very um, trashy kind of tattoo flash that actually um, you can <laughs> really see, it, but it's they're cool, they're very fun, look them up, which play with uh, like puns and architectural theory and history, and in very like ghetto style, and we then actually. Um, went with, it was financed by the Goethe Institute to the Biennale, the preview days, and yeah. set up at the German pavilion, the Hong Kong pavilion, different pavilions um, for like a couple of hours, and where we were tattooing people, but really like prison style tattoos. So it broke with this whole idea of the like the pristine architect dressed all in black in this like fancy event of the Biennale opening, and then having actually the dirty massage bench there, and dirty tattoos, and very rough drawings. Um, but it was a lot of fun. And there's, there's this theoretical backdrop to that too. And uh, this is a piece I did for last year's Architecture Biennale together with Leopold Panchini, where we did an installation in the Arsenale as an invited project, in which we did a big installation um, of models and publications inspired by the work of Lloyd Kahn. He's an 87-year-old publisher and self-builder from San Francisco, who was one of the um, first editors of the whole Earth Catalog and the Shelter publication and we kind of used this to make an homage to him. Then we brought it eventually to Bad Homburg to another exhibition and this Friday it will open at the DAZ German Architecture Center. Lloyd is 
arriving tomorrow, Leopold is arriving on Wednesday, Lloyd is arriving, so he's 87, he's coming to Berlin for the show. An incredible character, really a role model figure, um, very active, super interested. He has an Instagram account with, I think, 12,000 plus followers. He posts every day, he takes notes. Uh, I was traveling with him as well. He asks questions, like a super curious mind. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and, uh, and uh, amazing company to have. So if you want to meet uh, Lloyd, come to on Friday to the D Art Set. It's in Kreuzberg. It's a lot of information, huh? Are you still okay? We're almost done. That's cool. But then I'll be quiet for the rest of the semester. Yes, the others talking. But it's important for you to know who you're dealing with, yeah? You also need to know what, what uh, kind of drives me. Actually, this was it. Yeah. This, uh, I give my last word. Um, let's see if it works. To um, Virgil Abloh in an interview he did uh, with BBC 123, I forgot. I showed it also already last semester, but I think it's absolutely in point. Let's see. All day, all day. In a when it comes to self-expression, especially in the creative atmosphere, those things that hold you back from sort of executing on your dream are myths. It's in here, right? It's in your head. There's actually no consequence. And that's, you know, it took me that sort of period to like, question myself and be like, am I going to believe in the myth that I can't be a designer on, a, mm -hmm. on the highest level? Am I going to believe that I'm supposed to make printed t-shirts that are called streetwear? Or am I supposed to believe that I'm only going to DJ clubs that are willing to pay me whatever and just play whenever? And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to keep doing it for a long period of time until the one opportunity that comes across to say yes or no. And I'm going to say yes. I'm going to show up on time. Yep. I'm going to do my best. And then that's going to lead to some other opportunities. And I hope that through my narrative, people see that in themselves, that anything is achievable and there's different genres are just made to be jumped over. Yeah, so different genres are just made to be uh, jumped over. I think that's uh, the best closing line <laughs> I could wish uh, for. So at this point I say thank you for your attention um, for the last uh, 50 something uh, minutes um, and I hope I was able to um, give you an idea who you're dealing with up front here. And, um, yeah, for now it's in a way that you, you can uh, ask me uh, kind of any questions that, that come up from a logistical point of view. Obviously, um, mm, this is um, maybe not relevant for many of you, but those that are not uh, from the ULEK, who are not from the ULEK, um, welcome, first of all. Um, so we have a Moodle system here. Um, it's, it's, it's really called Moodle. Um, are, you, um, are you able to sign up for this? And, and do you need points, credits? I don't know yet. Okay, so I think um, it's not so many. Those of you that are not from the UDK, why don't you come to me and we'll figure out how you can come into this kind of Moodle system for these weekly reflections, etc. so you can get your credit points. But again, it's totally open, everyone is welcome, and even spread the word, um, also for the, for the, the coming uh, lectures. Um, it's, uh, the door is always open. Um, we, oh, wait, we're not done. Um, for the for the for for the um, coming um, semester, we have a couple of group works. And as I said in the beginning, I'm not really quite yet sure what we'll do, but we'll do something. Um, and we, we actually ended up uh, doing a little group work last semester when one of our speakers just didn't show up. That we were sitting here in a full house and uh, nobody came and it was not reachable. And then we kind of used it to do a kind of a get-together session, which was really, really nice, I have to say. So we'll see how, how, we, how we do it. Um, but um, I'm very much looking forward. But it's also an experiment. Again, I'm not doing stuff because I know them all too well, but I'm really doing this alongside with you. And that's, that's the, the fun, fun part of it. But do you have any comments or questions uh, at this point? Do we need to give feedback in this lecture? Yes. That's going to be your first exercise. <coughs> but you can give them now. No. 
No, uh, so again, this is uh, coming to this uh, personal reflections. Yes, this is also going to be part of it. Um, this kind of your first exercise. Um, and don't worry, it's uh, like I'm, I'm, nothing is being taken personal and you can write whatever you want, but it's, it's really, you're not doing this, and I say this every time, you're not doing this for me, you're doing it for yourself. You know, okay, you want credit points, you, that's, that's the um, <laughs> obligatory part of it, but all these exercises are um, really with the intent of um, helping yourself. And writing is something that, and actually all of the studies, except for GVK maybe, um, here at, this, at the school, you're not really used to, and it's a good thing to train, you know, to express your feelings or ideas. It doesn't have to be academic, no? Don't worry about footnotes or such. What about the presentation or name? Is there any ways to reach that somehow in writing? Um, how about presentations? How Uh, my presentation, yeah. for example. Ah, okay. Uh, my presentation is totally open access. I can I can put this in, in a file. And, and with the artist, it depends. Some some are more restrictive about it, but uh, I will always ask for it. And all of the lectures, also today, is recorded, live streamed. In case let's say you're sick at home or whatever, you can uh, live stream it, and you can also watch it a week later on the website of the UDK. Yeah, so you can always rewatch them uh, again which is quite nice. It's a beautiful archive of information. Also, I highly recommend you to kind of surf around the, um, the previous uh, lectures as well, because there was some really beautiful input there, too. Thank you for breaking the ice, by the way, for the question. <laughs> Another c comment or a question that you have? Yes. How do I curate uh, a Biennale, a big exhibition? Well, I haven't had the chance to curate a Biennale yet. <laughs> um, oh. but, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 but I'm going there. But, um, <laughs> no, just kidding. But <laughs> the, um, a big exhibition, I mean, in a way, the, the show that I, uh, the transgressive show, I mean, that's 48 artists. That's a lot of artists that you have to communicate with, no? Or Living a City is 50 plus artists. Um, um, so how do you cu uh, curate it? Um, it usually starts with a personal interest of mine in a certain topic, whether it's um, I have a personal relation to it or I'm just interested in the topic. Also with the arts and medicine that I'm totally new to but I'm starting to dig into. And then it usually starts with maybe, I don't know, I have a handful of references or um, artists or theorists or books. And then I dig deeper and deeper and deeper. And then actually I engage in conversations. Then I try to find people that kind of have worked on the subject and I talk to them. And they say, well, have you read so-and-so? Or have you heard of blah, blah, blah? And then this takes me to the next person. And this person tells me, oh, and have you heard this and this? And then kind of it becomes quite an organic way of growing. Uh, and then at one point you just have to kind of give it an end. Uh, I could have put uh, triple the amount of artists in each of these shows on the topic. Um, yeah, but so it's, it's this kind of balance um, between um, like an intuitive approach and then at one point a very structural one. Thank you for your question. I have another question. Yes, please. So what do you think is the difference between a really big exhibition and small ones? So for those of you that didn't hear it, what's the difference between a very big exhibition and a small one? Um, you know, the scale. <laughs> as, simple, as, as simple as that and the scale on every level because a big exhibition means you have a much bigger team, you have much more people to communicate with. For example, the transgressive exhibition, I mean Living the City was a huge exhibition, a big team and PR and blah and this etc. etc. In the transgressive I had funding from the Hauptstadt Kulturfonds and uh, I had to basically do everything by my own, so on, on each level. But uh, at the end it's really scale. I try to in, in uh, every project. Actually, it's the, the acoustics of the space is, sorry for those in the back, if you, even you, if you think that you're just whispering to your neighbor, it's actually quite loud in the front. So let's say, um, also for the speakers, if we have them, we have to kind of be aware of the spatial dynamics. So we, we can chatter in a second. Um, uh, now I lost my train of thought, but uh, I talk about scales and exhibitions and what was my last sentence? Scale. No, scale, I, <laughs> scale, I, scale I said already. A lot of people, like yourself, um, for trans uh, 
Ah, for, yeah, no, for transgressive I had to do a lot of uh, things. But yes, and that's where I wanted to go to, but I try to always, also, this is a big group, but I'll try to really understand who all of you are, and I will be reading all of your feedback, and I really take that serious, so I try to create a connection somehow, whether it's a seminar, or whether it's an exhibition, whether it's small, or whether it's big. Yeah. Yes? To create a product, uh, for example, an exhibition or a book, do you um, think about the audience that you want to receive, or you think about the concept first, or like which method do you use to make sure it's going to succeed? Yeah, well, you never know if it succeeds, um, but I usually go via topic first, and as a topic and people. In a way, um, my work is connecting ideas and connecting people. Um, and, and it, no, no matter whether it's in an academic context or an exhibition context or book context. And generally speaking, I always try to think um, as a curator of being able to address uh, like a professionally interested audience that already comes with background knowledge. And I want to kind of satisfy, satisfy their expectations so that they don't come through, oh, it's boring and all of this. But at the same time, I don't want to overwhelm someone who's completely new. So it's always this kind of fine balance that you have to find as a curator of or mediator or even educator of not, not pushing away those that come already with knowledge, um, kind of giving them something to feed, but those that are completely new and are maybe a bit shy or insecure, to invite them in. So that's why I always try to think, okay, my exhibition, my small daughter should have fun in there or my mother should have fun in there and everything in between. And that's c kind of how, how I approach it. And I try to always make it public and an open Access. We had this in the colloquium earlier. Doesn't work all the time, but um, um, for the record, spoiler alert, the world that we all work and live in, or you will be working, or are studying in, is very exclusive. Yeah, this is a highly exclusive group of people in this room. No, um, me, uh, all of us included. And because um, it's, you know, cultural realm is like this big and, uh, and, and like the entrance level is difficult. I mean, go to a museum, if you go to Martin Gropius, well, you have to pay like 15 or whatever, 10 years. I mean, it's, it's expensive, man. It's like more than going to the cinema. So I think culture should in general be open access and public. So to make it, because again, I talked about the moon and art and how important all of this is. It is I totally believe in culture, but it has to be towards and for everyone and accessible for everyone. Follow-up yeah, question. And how you like? How do you see uh, the internet or like new media to make that public? Or if you have experimented on yeah. these kind of events, but exclusively online or something? Yeah, both. I mean, we all had to in the last couple of years, obviously. No, both um, because of the pandemic, both in exhibition making and lectures and symposiums and here the, the seminar which started as an, in persona and the first time around then became um, an online seminar. I think it's an amazing another medium. I like, I, like, I like to explore all means of communication, the book, the exhibition, the internet, um, uh, Instagram, TikTok, they're, they're all mediums that's again scavenger methodology, like use all of them to kind of bring your point across and also access all of them to um, source information. But yeah, there are great possibilities there uh, that are still to, there's, there's more gaming, etc. There's, there's, that's also last semester we had Daniel Brethwaite Shirley, the artist who works with only game engines. So there's, ugh, it's beautiful, there's always new medias um, coming that you can, it's like new brushes, new tools, new, new canvases to, to experiment with. No, I did not do the <laughs> opening screen. I give credits to my dear friend Florian Lamm. Lamm und Kirch is a, um, a graphic design practice. But um, I briefed them. So the images that you see in the back um, were actually from an old Tumblr page of mine. So you know when Tumblr was still a thing? <laughs> it's gone, but it was cool. And I, I like to collect these weird images. And then when I had to do the first juxtaposition, I was like, OK, what do I do? And I said, like, oh, I just use my Tumblr images. They're cool. They've never been used. And I, threw uh, to Florian Lam a whole bunch of them and then he made this thing and then he used this font and I, actually I thought about it today because it has a bit of a comic approach to me and it could be in comic magazine and that kind of connects to the Mad magazine that I showed in the beginning also with these kind of elements so I don't know you know things happen for, for a reason yeah yes 
Uh, yes, I will happily do so. I think it's very simple, like Studio Lucas Fire is a Tumblr, but I'll put it in the, in the middle group. But it's old, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't updated, I don't even know how to access it anymore, but it's, it's still a nice source of images. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm? I would like to return to the first question. Yeah. You said that all new medias are open to the but you, you put also the, the image of McLuhan saying the medium is the message. So aren't you worried that putting everything on the social media could um, change the value that of what are you putting on the social media? Um, am I afraid if I'm using social media would de decrease the value of the content? Change, let's say change. Yeah, I'm open for that. No, but I'm not worried. I'm totally not worried and I'm op open for completely unexpected interpretations or appropriations of the work just as I do, you know? I, I appropriate like crazy, like I, 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 you know, I take influences from, from everywhere. And no, I'm, I'm, I'm not about, I'm not, but it's not, I'm not the type of guy who worries about, oh, this could, etc. no. Like I also, um, I uh, have a, how to say, like an interesting relationship to kind of artistic production or cultural production uh, in a sense that I do not believe in artistic originality. Like I do not believe Again, spoiler alert, alert and so sorry to break it to you, but none of you are original. Like, you, you can all be super authentic and I totally dig your work, and it's amazing, but definitely not original in the sense of you create you're the origin of something new. No, sorry. Everything has been done or, you know, said, written, and, and it's such a liberating realization. It's not like, oh shit, you know, I can, no, like, take that pressure off your shoulders. It's amazing. You don't have to worry about that, of, of being original, but like, what's interesting is how can you bring your authentic note to it, you know, your authentic signature that's only you and nobody else, because again, despite everything being done and said, there's none of you like you. There's only you in the entire world, and so you will bring your personal touch to things, but never think that any of the stuff is original. So, coming back to social media, no, I'm not worried about these things at all. You had another question. Yes, uh, I want to ask about open access. Yeah. Since you mentioned that's very important for you, that like if you're, you mentioned entrance fees as a hurdle to that. Yeah. How is, like, do you have approaches for making things more open, also in the financial sense, yeah. while still ensuring that obviously you want artists to get paid? Like in the end, ah, yeah, so thank you for the question. Open access, how do you deal with the fact that most cultural institutions uh, ask for entrance fee? Um, I do that by trying to work with cultural institutions that don't. And or the transgressive exhibition that I showed before, is which I organized and I um, applied for funding from the Hauptstadt Kulturfonds. And I could have, in the financial plan, said I make an entrance of one, two, three, four, five, ten euros, but I deliberately said, no, it's also co totally against the topic of the exhibition. Make, you make an exhibition about unauthorized approaches and maybe illegal, and you say, but it was 10 euros. It's like, <laughs> like this, uh, you know, it, I, I would not be very authentic uh, in that sense. But again, there's other institutions where it's unavoidable, but for me, um, actually most, of, if not all of them, um, have been institutions that also share the same philosophy. Or for example, that this is, literally open to everyone, or that we are archiving this and it's online, talking about uh, uh, online archives, and it's just an attempt from my side. And uh, it will not always work, but I'll try to make it work as, as much as possible. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, Thank you for all the beautiful questions, by the way. It makes me very happy. That's a really interesting question that I would have to really think about. I, 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 think, um, I think I have an answer to why, because it's been a topic of mine uh, lately. Um, and it's a very sensitive topic that uh, is um, uh, very little addressed. And um, 
Okay, so maybe uh, uh, why I, it's totally subconscious. I did not notice it. Thank you for, for reminding me. And uh, I also don't like want, if I, if I uh, if this was insensitive, then I apologize for that. But in this exhibition, Transgressive, which was basically on the influences of the city, but also graffiti, etc., which on, on a lot of artistic practices, um, which is usually a very, um, in a scene that's dominated by, um, um, toxic masculinity. Yeah, it's a, uh, there's a lot of dudes. Or, like, you know, it's, it's changing, but the the world that I grew up in was very much like this, and you didn't really speak about emotions. It's absolutely not happening. And we did a memorial event in this exhibition where we thought of um, uh, you know dead graffiti writers, and we made like videos about them and had family members talking, etc. And of these four, actually two of them committed suicide, and they. Uh, and then we also spoke to a sociologist and we made a whole list of graffiti writers from Berlin in the last 20, 30 years that passed away. It's 65 or 66, a lot. And a great many of them committed suicide. Reflecting on society in general, it was kind of the same percentage as we see in, uh, in, in, in society per se. But it's um, um, also maybe committing suicide is the wrong word um, or they chose self-death or whatever it is, but it is, it is a very little discussed topic and um, because it also brings questions of mental health and uh, safe spaces and who cared or who didn't care. And for us in this exhibition, in this context was really ice and groundbreaking to show a great vulnerability in it and address topics that are usually not discussed in this scene. So anyways, this is something that really it had a huge effect on me and I think that's why subconsciously I mentioned this here, but very well noticed. Thanks for your attention. Yeah. And the next question is obviously hard after this one. <laughs> No, if there's no more questions. No, great. One in the way. It's a very different question, so I can't do that. But um, we can't really see your face, and I think that's like, interesting. And that, like, throughout, I, and, like, there's always sun or like, light in your face. And I was wondering it's super that. annoying, by the way, yeah. but he told me I have to stand here. <laughs> I think because he's out of the picture. Yes, a lot of white light. Yeah. You know, that's good. That's horrible. Yeah. Uh, ah, okay. So here, here, here I am. <laughs> Yeah, good. I'll give this to my, my camera and, and directorial team here. So uh, let's figure out a way. It's good that we turned on the light, by the way. You know, Felipe, you wanted to turn off the light. They would have all be sleeping by now. Yeah. No, thanks for the for the directorial comment. Here I am, by the way. No. Um, yeah, cool. So if I, I, can, I think we can wrap it up now. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you for being here. We will actually meet again uh, next week already. That's, and I realize it's Halloween. Ah, it's stupid, but you know, you have to trick or treat before or afterwards. Um, it's uh, Li Ning. Um, it was originally Daphne Ayers next week. We had to change because I think she has to attend a trick or treat event with her son. Um, but Li Ning is coming next week, and I'm very excited about that. Are you already? Fa who's familiar with Li Ning's work? That's only one shy person. That's all? Okay, then great. It's going to be a lot of surprise. So we start with a musician, a singer, a videographer, and uh, art director as the first person to speak to us. And um, yeah, um, until next week, I think tonight or tomorrow, I'll put this question on Moodle. You know, what are your thoughts? You, can, you have to kind of finish this up always before the next session. Uh, other than that, I wish you a wonderful uh, Monday evening. Thank you for being here and see you next week.